this way. Father Lord, we exalt and honor you. We thank you for the grace that is shed for us tonight. We thank you for the name that is highly lifted up. Father Lord, there is none that can deliver from your hand. When you walk, none has the ability to do that. Father Lord, tonight we have better things to do together in your presence. To exalt and to honor you. To thank you in the midst of your congregation. For the Lord, your people call upon you and they will not be to stay. Holy Spirit, guide our action tonight. Lead us into a fellowship where only God alone will be glorified. For the Lord, let no man be seen or heard throughout today's teaching. But let your word and your Son, Jesus Christ, be clear. Father, Lord, God of hosts, for as many that will come to this meeting sick, come with serious sickness and affliction, may you meet them at the very point of their name. This we ask to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome tonight to this Open Heart Fellowship. Today, our teaching is first call to be a disciple. First call to be a disciple. What is Christian first call? The first call of every believer is to be a disciple. The rest call might follow, but your first call, if you want to serve God, is to be a disciple. Are you ready to serve God in your life? Do you want God to be your birthright in this land of the living? Your first call is to be a disciple. Tonight, we are having another exciting teaching of our Open House Fellowship. This night is an opportunity for many believers to understand the topic, discipleship. But our teaching is still under the topic, leadership. Leadership. But before you can be a leader, you must first and foremost be a disciple. So that's why it is important for you to pay attention to today's teaching. Because you cannot really become a leader except you are first and foremost a disciple. Nobody can give you responsibility except you have been able to take care of that which is another. So before you can be given responsibility in the body of Christ, even in your secular world, you must first of all learn how to take care of that which is another person's property. Because if you cannot take care of another person's property, Nobody in this world will give you your true value or your true riches, which is your own. So that is why as a leader, your first call, your point, first four point of call or contact is to be first and foremost a disciple. Tonight I will be your host. My name is Missionary Collins. I am from Christian Global Foundation. I will be your teacher in this Open House Fellowship for this evening. God bless you as you listen. So our text today is taken from the book of John, John, the Gospel according to St. John, or John chapter 12. So this book was written by John, so we are looking at chapter 12 of that book from verse 1. And Jesus then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was. Who was this Lazarus? This Lazarus was the man who Jesus raised from the dead after four days. He came because he was his friend. Because actually he came to Bethany for the Passover. But he came six days before the Passover and is lodged in the house of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, which has been dead, and whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, Martha said, but Lazarus was one of the men that sat at the table with Christ. Lazarus was one of the men that sat at the table with Christ. Then said one of his disciples, before then, in, verse, in chapter 12, verse 3, then took Mary a pound of ultimate of spinach, 
very costly and anoint Jesus, anoint Jesus' feet and wipe his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ultimate. It's an expensive perfume. He poured it at Jesus' feet. Who is this Mary? Mary is the sister of Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. And this lady understood what Christ has done for their family. When he came again, she came with thanksgiving. She poured the ultimate on his feet and washed it with her hair. That is a symbol of respect and thanksgiving for what Christ has done for the family. But something significant happened here. Judah is Iscariot, who know better, said to Jesus, this ultimate, he already calculated the cost of the oil, that this rich perfume oil cost about 300 pence. So we would have sell it for 300 pence instead of pouring it at your feet. It's a waste. Nobody is here. You are not going to a special occasion. You are not the king. Instead of pouring it at your feet, we would have sell it and use it to pay some of the mission expenses, like giving money to the poor. Jesus' response was simple. You always have the poor with you. But me, you don't always have. Christians must learn to understand that there is time for everything under heaven. You cannot neglect the basic rights of serving God all in the name of donating for mission or donating to the church. God expects you first and foremost to be a disciple of God. Every other work like giving your tithes, your offering, your contribution, your donation, they are appreciated. But before those things ever come to the surface, you must first be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn the basics, understand the truth, qualify into the class of leadership. That's why in mission, we don't go from town to town, put a bowl of office in the front of people you are supposed to save, to say, come and give. For the financing of the mission. The reason is because they need to know the truth. An unbeliever cannot truly appreciate giving to God. He will see it as an extortionist. But for a mature believer, he gives willingly from his heart. He knew that it is not given to you, but it's given to God. But unbeliever will not see it that way. That's why, as a Christian, you must understand that your first goal is to train people to become a disciple of Christ before you start introducing other Christian faith. Even Apostle Paul make it clear to us. He says we give meek to children, but among the mature we impart wisdom. Wisdom is not imparted among the babes in Christianity. Because a carnal man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness in his eyes. He cannot understand it, neither can he know it. Why? Because they are designed by the Spirit. So, it's only a spiritual being that can understand the things of the Spirit. It's only he that is born of God that knows the things of God. If you are not born of God, you cannot be matured enough to understand the things of God. Because no man knows the things of God except the Spirit of God that is in him. And just as no man knows the things of man except the Spirit of man that lives in him. So it's only when our spirit can bear weakness, is matured enough to bear weakness with the Spirit of God, that we can know the things that are freely given us of God. So that is why, as a Christian, you must first of all learn the rudiments. Yes, God just called you into the ministry. He wants you to lead 5,000 people. He wants you to lead 20,000 people. He showed you a stadium in a dream. It's a good dream. But first, be a disciple. Learn the rudiments. Learn the quality of being a Christian. Because if you don't, if you are not a Christian, it doesn't matter how many people feed your stadium. You will not know what to tell them. So the first thing is be a Christian. Be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let the rudiment, let the tenant of faith. That's why if you check the link below, we send you a link with a simple booklet, Convert Guide. Because as a Christian, you have come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have accepted salvation. But that is not the end. You need to be tutored. You need to know the steps. You need to crank the basic ladders of life in Christianity. So that these ladders can lead you to a maturity that only Christ's grace can give you. But you cannot crank this ladder of your own volition. You need guidance. You need counseling. You need men of integrity and men of faith to guide you on the path. It doesn't matter how many years you have been in the faith. There is no shame in it. You might be in the faith for 30 years. You don't know what it means to be a disciple. You can be in the church for 150 years. All you know is how to gossip. But it doesn't matter. All you need to come, learn the basic, the rudiment of faith. You have to understand the basis of what salvation is. What sin is. What an atonement is. What redemption is. Before you can crank the ladder to the next steps. That's why we don't just take new converts from the mission field and introduce them into the mission. Yes, they may have zeal from God. They may even be called to do the work. But when temptation comes, they will wither. That's why Jesus Christ made it clear to us in the parable of the sower that some seed fell on the wayside. What happened to them? They were not properly discipled. They received the word of God just like every Christian. They receive it with gladness of heart. But because it does not have root in them, the evil one came and it ate up the world. Today, may God not allow the devil eat up the gospel you have heard. If what you receive from God, and I'm ascertain, if it is not granted in you, it's like a seed that fell upon the rocky ground that produced roots, but if roots have no much soil, so when scorching it come, it fell. When trials and tribulation of this world come, your root will not be able to stand the test of time. So that's why as a leader, you must first be disciple. That was, if you go through the scriptures, we can take examples from both New and Old Testament. Elijah did something unique in his time. And what did he do? When he was called, when Elisha was called, Elisha followed Elijah's footsteps, became his attendant, poured water in the hands of Elijah until the day God took him up to heaven. This happened consequently throughout the scripture. In the Bible, we call them the sons of the prophets. They were opportune to learn during that period, which is known as the discipleship period. But in this case, it was till his master was taken before his prophet's regime starts. Not all the sons of the prophet ever became prophets in the scripture. So never make it to the end. Discipleship period is a period of trial. That's why the Bible makes it clear to you that a hair, as long as it's a child, is not different from a son. Though he be the master of the house, but is kept under guide and tutor until the time appointed by the master. It is only the time that the father, who is the master of the house, appoints that will make that child free. Though he is the ruler of everything in the house, he is not different from ordinary servant in the house because he's under tutor, he's under guidance, he's under discipline to bring him up to speed so that he can be able to rule his house. If we call ourselves Christian, we are not willing to take chastisement. We are not sons of God. We are bastards. Christians who are Christians must be willing to assess chastisement, discipline, correction from God. Shall you always receive good from God? 
Will you not also endure it when you are tempted? Will you not also take pains and shame? What about Christ in the New Testament? What did he do? He was a son in heaven. He was in the form of a God. He did not see it as a thing of robbery to be equal with God. So what did he do? He humbled himself. Even being formed and functioned as a man, he humbled himself. He took upon himself. He did not take upon himself the form of an angel. He took the form of a servant. And he became obedient. Even to the point of death. Even a shameful death on the cross. The death of a criminal. He was obedient. If this mind be in you, that is also in Christ Jesus, today's teaching will make a lot of sense to you. But if you are proud and arrogant, Today's teaching will make no sense to you, no matter how much experience you have in the Christian faith. God bless you as you listen. So now, let's go to our teaching for today. First call to be a disciple. Your first call as a Christian is to be a disciple. Why must your first call be a disciple? If anyone would come after me, Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 16, from verse 24 to 25, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. First, you want to come to become like Christ, it's a good thing, but you have to deny who you are. You have to cast down your identity. You are a professor, you are an academician, you are a PhD holder, you are a pastor. You are bishop, you are doctor, you are evangelist. You have to keep it in your pocket. You must deny your identity. You are call of God. You have anointed voice. You can prophesy. You can sing like angel. Keep it in your pocket. Deny who you are. And take up your cross. Carry your own cross. And follow Jesus. What is cross? Cross is a body. Cross is a period of training. Cross is discipline. Cross is a time of humility. Being humble, being laughed at, being spit on your face, being slapped on the streets. People that are not up to your standard pour water on you. And they mock at you. Jesus gave his beer to those that pull it out. This is the time of cross. You must be ready to endure the same. His servant is not greater than his master. Neither is he that is sent greater than the one that sent him. If you were sent, you must discipline yourself like the one that sent you. The one that sent you was not different. He healed their children. He raised their dead. He cast out many devils. Opened the eyes of the blind. They lay walk. But they hand him to the cross. And they said to him, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And we will believe in you. So you are not different. If they do so to the one that sent them, even when the tree is green, what do you think they will do when it is dry? So brethren, do not take it strange when you suffer various persecution, as if some strange things have happened to you. The call of God and his blessings and not only blessings. They are also mixed with trial period. Love suffering is one of the fruit of the Spirit. You must accept it if you can grow in the Lord. For whosoever wants to save his life will have to lose it. But whoever loses his life willingly will find it. So, as Christians, we have to be prepared to die daily. Daily lay down our life for the sake of the gospel. Daily lay down our pride for the sake of the one that calls us. When they slap us, we entreat. When they insult us, we bear it. That is what makes us a Christian. Christian does not avenge himself. I remember when the apostles of Christ, John and James, went to the Samaritan to ask favor from them. Give us some food and water. They refused them. James was so furious and John as well. 
So who is this Samaritan to deny us when we are of higher hierarchy, the Jews than the Samaritan? Jesus, just let us, give us permission, let us go and burn them with fire. <laughs> Jesus looked at them and said, you don't know what manner of authority you are made of. The Son of Man did not come to take people's life, but rather to save them. He rebuked them. So, you should not do differently. Are you threatening in your feet? Endure it. If you persecute you in one city, run to the next one. And I tell you, even Isaac, Abraham directs descendants. He dig a well, the enemy came, they cover it. He moved forward again, he dug another well up. The enemy came and they cover it up. And he came again and he dug another well. The enemy came and they covered it. But when he dug the one he did not cover, he said, God has made room for me. And I tell you, you will not have gone through all the city of the earth before God will make room for you. And you will prosper in that land. And you will flourish in it. Brethren, learn the principles of the disciple of Christ and their followers. How they live their life. Follow the same. The best way to see Jesus is to be with him. Then you will both see him and hear his voice clearly. In Luke 8 verse 1. Let's read Luke 8 1. Because of our time will be a bit fast today. Luke 8 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and villages, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. What? Why did he take the twelve in this preaching? Why did he not go alone? After all, it was a separate mission. No. The twelve need to see how he does it. So that when their time comes, they will know how it is done. Are you called of God? Attach yourself to a minister. Not just attend services. Attach yourself to a missionary to, or a pastor or to an evangelist. Learn the rudiments. If you are called, you want to be an evangelist, learn from another evangelist. You want to be a, an apostle, learn from another one. You want to be a prophet, learn from another prophet. See how you follow his footsteps. Learn until you are mature. It's not covetousness. And when you are matured enough in the feet, God will send you out in his own time. I remember when I was sent out. First, I went to become a disciple in a church. That's why I have more knowledge. I went there and they put me back into the school I've already completed. And I participated in full time. It was when I was about to be integrated that God said, no, this is not where I sign you. Get up now and leave. So that is what it means. For you to be a disciple, you must learn from people. It doesn't matter the call of God upon your life, how great it is, or how mighty your call is. You must learn until you become a leader. So as a leader, your first point of contact is discipleship. Then you will see, you will both see him and hear his voice clearly. Those that follow Jesus, he call what? Disciple. They call why are they disciple? The disciple is to worship. They follow his footsteps. They learn from their master. And they understand the doctrine of their leader. And the word which means learner. Pupils. Apprentice. These are all disciples. If we use this word today, like in school, we have pupils, we have learner. In people learning experience in workplace, we call them apprentice. Why can't we do the same in the church? Apprentice is not meant to serve you forever. If apprentice is meant to serve you forever, that means the person will never have this on her own life. Apprentice is made to serve you for a period of time until he himself has mastered the trade or the craft and is able to move ahead 
unto his required thing. So it is in the ministry. Christians are not meant to be permanent pew in a church. When you have permanent pew in a church, don't complain when they become gossiper, backbiter, ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth like James and Gabriel. People are meant to graduate. In school, your children does not stay in primary school forever. They graduate to secondary school, then to university. And they go afterwards to their own individual business or offices. So you expect people also in your church to graduate from membership to discipleship, from discipleship to leadership in the church, from leadership to pastoral care, from pastoral care, then they start their own ministry. God does not expect. Stop crying when people leave your church. If people don't leave your church, how will the church of God spread? God expects people to be disciples for a period. Jesus' discipleship period was just for three and a half years. Your own should not be longer. The lesson is from John 12, verse 19 to 33. John 12, we we'll read from verse 19. It says, They came unto him, his mother and his belly, and could not come at him for the press. The people were so much, the mother could not even assess his presence. And it was told him by a certain disciple, we said that mother and that virgin stand without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these, which hear the word of God and do it. Who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus made it clearer that discipleship comes first before his earthly family. So your disciples are closest people to you. They come even before your personal family. And it's all about the cost of being a disciple. Peter left, Peter had wife and children before he was called into to become Christ's disciple or into discipleship. But he left it all for the sake of the gospel. And when Peter, Jesus was beginning to ask about, when they begin to ask about the word, Peter asked Jesus a question. What about us? Who has left everything? Wife, business, finance, everything for the sake of the gospel. We will not be rewarded. Jesus said to them, There is no one that left his father, mother, sister, brother for my sake that will not in this world have double. Double of what? Everything he think he lost. And in the kingdom of heaven, have everlasting life. So the cost of being a disciple is ability to leave things behind. If you cannot leave sacrifice for God, God cannot sacrifice for you. What did God say to Saul? He said, I have thought that thou family will be planted forever in Israel. But God forbid. He who honor me, I will honor. If you honor God, God will honor you. But if you disregard him, you will be likely esteemed. A price that has little to do with money. Some people say, go. I can be a member of a discipleship team even if I don't go to church. I can just send money. I always hear this phrase from many people when they want to support mission. If I cannot go for mission, my money can go for me. That's a lie. Your money cannot go for you. The kingdom of God cannot be bought with money. They will. You have reward for giving money. If you sow money into the kingdom, you get money in return. If you sow so, you get a seat in heaven. But if you take sowing money into the kingdom, we take you to heaven, you are lying. If you sow money into the kingdom, you get money as a reward. The whole world has gone after him. Some men from Greece came to Philip, one of Jesus' apprentices or disciple, who was a Grecian like they were, and said that they would like to see Jesus. Philip told his brothers, Andrew, and both of them went and asked Jesus 
for an appointment for their new friend. What did Jesus say in chapter 12, verse 21? Let us read. 12, 21. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus would have been pleased with their request because he had just thought saying in John 10 verse 16 I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen and I must bring them also they will listen to my voice maybe these men from Greek were the first to come to him from other nations other sheep pens that are not of this fold he should not be happy to receive them. We should be happy to welcome people into the branch. He wants to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Have you noticed that sometimes Jesus gives the most unusual response to our questions and requests? His answer deal with the real issue which are not always what we are asking about. We would expect an answer like 3 o'clock, tomorrow at 10 a.m. But the answer that Jesus gave, we once understand it. We tell us all how we can see Jesus and know him intimately. What did he say? In John 12, chapter 23 to 28. 23 to 28, what did he say? He says, but as they called, as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water. And were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind. And the raging of the water and the seas, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and the water, they obey him. What manner of man is this? And then and he said unto them, Where is your faith? In verse 25. Where is your faith? These were men who were fishermen. They have been used to see from since they were children. But something unusual happened. That storm was great. It threatened for storm to threaten fishermen who went and stayed all night in the little boat. This was a great storm. But Jesus expected them to have known that no storm can carry the sheep where he lies. That is a lesson for we to learn as a disciple, especially in the area of mission and Christian church. There may be a storm in your church or in the mission. That is a threatening to swallow you up, threatening to break the boat apart. Always remember the word of God. What did God say concerning it? Jesus expected the disciples to know that God said, if you walk through the water, it will not overwhelm you. If you go through fire, you will not be burnt. Jesus, they know the scripture. Jesus expected them to have confidence in the scripture they know. Knowing the word is not enough for the service you are called into. You need to understand the application. That's why you go to school. You can graduate from school and you come to office, you fail every single interview. That is not because you don't know what the interviewer was saying. The, interview is, the interviewer is not looking for what you graduated from in school. He's looking for the application. How does your study help my job? How does your education help my daily activity in the office? The same thing comes with Christians. Oh, John 3 is for God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. 
But what the people want to hear is not John 3.16. They want to understand how does your John 3.16 help them to be a better person? How does it apply to their death charge? How does it apply to their lack of rest day and night? How does it apply to their life of deprivation and sin? How do you use this John 3 system to heal their sicknesses, to revive their womb, to bring them back from captivity, from the path of darkness into light? They, they heard you say this, come unto me all in that labor and a heavy love, and I will give you rest. They want to know the application. How the world is going to transmute into their rest. They heard you say this, by his stripes you are healed. They want to know how that stripes is going to transmit to the healings in their body. So those are the application. You cannot learn this from reading. You can only learn it from being a disciple. Disciple grows your faith. Because why? Discipleship grows your faith. How does it grow your faith? Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing. You cannot have faith except you see and hear. Faith comes by hearing. And how does hearing come? From the word of God you hear. From your day-to-day -day activity as a disciple. A disciple grew himself to his master. So that he can learn his master's way. Practice his master footstep. Understand his master path. This teaching is what will strengthen you to overcome all your daily omitment. Christians are Christians not because they go to church. Christians are Christians. Because they follow the path set down for all disciples. Do you want to be a disciple today? Follow the same path that Jesus set. The same standard he laid for the apostle. His standard has not changed. He has not altered his word. So you can also learn from him by being obedient to the laid down rules. To the instruction he passed to every man. And woman upon the surface of the earth. But what did they hear? They did not hear 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Don't worry, when I wake up in, from this sleep by 7 a.m., I will rebuild the storm. No. He woke up and he went straight to this trouble that was troubling them. Are you telling me that the wave shaking the boats did not shake Jesus in his sleep? He knew, but he was asleep. Peace is not the essence of trouble. Having peace is having peace in the middle of uncertainty and trouble. That's what makes you a Christian. Christianity does not mean you are always feeling in your pocket. You are always having the best car, riding on the best car. Living in the best house. No. Christianity is more than that. Christianity is having confidence in God. When all roads lead down. When every path is a dry land. When all hope are gone. When everything you put your trust in fails you. Your confidence in you becomes corruption. That is when your Christian faith is attested. That's why the Bible told you that how shall the just live? The just shall live by faith. Your daily life does not depend on how much you have in your account. How much business is prospering. How many customers you have. It's easier to have faith in God when all those things are up. But watch, watch for your faith when there is none. When all those indices are pointing downward, your business, zero. Your finance, zero. Food for today, nowhere to be found. Your members crying for bread and they stress hand to you and you they are crying to has nothing to offer them. 
That is when your faith is tested. That is when we know whether God, you have been discipled or not. When they come for you for tax, when there is no money anywhere to pay for it. Like in the case of Jesus. That is when your disciple will come to you. Say, Master, they are asking for tax. Are we going to disobey them? You teach us to always obey. That is your principle. This is where your faith are put to practice. So you learn by experience. You learn 100%. That's why in mission we believe in discipleship more than physical Bible training. The hour has come. Meaning yes. The hour has come. Meaning yes. It is time for men to see the glory of God. So, that means even Christ knew there is time for everything. A disciple knows there is time. But people who are not disciples don't know God's time. But a disciple waits patiently for the time for God to manifest. It is still time. Now is always the best time of all. To have to die. That sounds like a shocking statement. But Jesus is not talking about physical death in order to grow and multiply a seed of wheat, has to be buried. Just the same way, if a Christian must grow, he must be able to put to death the desire of the flesh. And every thing that he loves or desire in the world must be buried in the world. In order for him to be able to rise in the spirit, lose its outer shells and has right time to emerge with a new life. So as a Christian, you want to grow into leadership, you must be ready to lose your outer shell. Things that clips to you when you will be converted. Those things you have not been able to do without, you must lose them. And you must bury them in the ground. This may take time. It doesn't happen automatically. Lose your shell. And at the right time, you will emerge in a newness of life. Which bear much fruit. That's why the Bible said, I set a grain of corn fell into the ground and that he abandoned alone. Until you, are, you learn to multiply your desire. And you learn to live singly for God, not for your ambition, not for your wants, not for the things you desire in life. You can never emerge into the life that God has promised. But when you put to death the enmity that comes with the flesh, then God in you can emerge in the fullness of time. The same is true of our lives and the old nature. It is true that has to it is true that we has to die with all its selfish and passion be buried with Christ and rise in the newness of life born again. Because when we talk about being born again is being thrown around in Christian cycle. Born again means that you have mortified the deed of the flesh. The flesh has no more control over you. Now the life you now live, you don't live for yourself. You live for the one that lives and dies for you. That is what it means to be born again. It doesn't mean to go to church. It doesn't mean to serve as chorister or as a prayer warrior. It means that Christ is alive or you are died. So no man can kill you, nor are you afraid of physical death because you have already been put to death. The life you now live is no longer your own. 
You live for the one that dies for you. And this born again into a new life is a spiritual process of the decay of the physical flesh and the resurrection or the growth of the newness of life. When you are born again spiritually, you will see Jesus clearly in John 33. John 33. Let's read. John 33. He said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Very, very, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot what? See the kingdom of God. So let's pause a little while. Jesus did not say, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter. But he said, He cannot even see it. So if you cannot see it, you cannot even go close. That means, except you are born of the Spirit, you have put to death the flesh, and the Spirit of God is alive in you, you cannot even see heaven by any spiritual vision. You cannot even see it. So if you cannot prophesy of the things of heaven. You cannot see God in your dream. You cannot see visions about heaven. A carnal man can never see the things of God. That's why as a Christian, when somebody comes to you and says, I just saw heaven, ask him one simple question. Are you born again? Are you born of water? and of the Spirit of God? Because this is the condition of seeing heaven. If you have none of those two, you cannot see it. Not to talk of entering into it. Romans 6, 1-14 Clearly explain this. Romans 6. Let's read fast. Romans 6. From verse 1. He said. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin. That the grace of God may abound? So when we talk about being born again. It's an ability not to continue in sin. You have to put to death. The enmity that is in the flesh. Which is sin. Now the Bible says we have been buried. Many Christians will teach you it's not baptism is no longer important. Who told you that? What is baptism? You have been buried with Christ. It's a symbol that when you are deep into the water, that means burial, physical burial with Christ. That means all your sins, your Adamic nature, everything that defies in you is put down, buried in the water. Now when you rise, you are rising in glory. You were so in corruption. You will rise in glory. You are so in the flesh, but you rise in spiritual being. That is what it means to be born again. To be born again means you have been planted in the likeness of the fruits. And now you are emerging as a new creature. Just as anyone that is dead has ceased from sin. Your sin has been put to death with you as you died in the water. When you rise from the water, the sin can no longer live with you. That's why we don't baptize children. Because children cannot understand the rudiment. So, for you to be baptized, you must have inherited sin by having full knowledge. Because the Bible says the days of ignorance, God overlooks and have you understand your consciousness of sin. You are not buried with sins in the water. And when you rise, you rise from the fullness of life. That is why Christians baptized. In verse 2, he makes us understand. God forbid, shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in sin? We are dead to sin. Shall we any more? Live longer in sin, you have been buried with sin. Disciple also has to die daily. You have to die daily. What does it mean to die daily? Daily die to sin until you become a precious stone before God. Every day of your life, you have to put any character, any thoughts 
that does not conform to Christ, you have to put it to death. The greatest obstacle of seeing Jesus is always self. So for you to be able to become a Christian, your repentance should not be once. That is why we are against those that say once saved, you are forever saved. That is not true. It is true that salvation was completed on the cross, but you have to continue because the battle is not secure until you get home. The only way you will be free from repenting is when you are flying on the air to heaven. But if you are not yet flying to heaven in the air, you are not secure. So you have to die daily, every day of your life. Every day, because the devil will not stop tempting you until the day you die. So you must not stop fighting the devil until the day you die. And the sin will not stop coming to your heart until the day you die. So you must not stop fighting sin. Don't relax as a Christian. The Bible says, He that thinks it is found, lest he take heed, lest he should fall. Christian is not a relaxing place. The mission field is not a place of eating and drinking. It's not a place of wine. When you say it is peace, sudden destruction will come. So that's why as a Christian, you must discipline your body. You must put your entire body under complete control. So this is why we disciple people. Discipleship is not a time of eating and drinking. It's not when we gather people together in a class and tell them John 3.16, they can read the Bible by themselves. But what we teach them in discipleship is follow me as I follow Jesus. Follow me as I follow Jesus. The temptation I go through, go through it. The pain I go through, go through it. Follow the same footsteps. The greatest obstacle to seeing Jesus is always self. And that is going to be our own thing. Our, in our own way. Time has not come for the house of God to be built. Don't worry. But it's this time. God is asking you a question. The time has not come. Because the enemy are threatening from every corner. Whenever you decide to lay the foundation of the block of house, the landlord will come with gun. And they will, the association will gather around you. The community will say, no church must be built here. You say, well, time has not come to build the house of God. God is asking you a question. Is it time for you to leave your own house? Is it time for you to go to your business? Is it time for you to plant and to reap? If the time to build the house of God has not come, is it time for you to live in your own house and to sleep upon your own bed with your wife and children beside you? God is asking you a question. Oh, time has not come for evangelism. When the time comes, all these people will be willing. The Bible says, the day of the Spirit of the Lord, people shall be willing. Thank God for you. What time is it? Is it time for you to be blessed? Is it time for you to plant? Is it time for you to pay tax and get the benefits? Is it time for you to give offering in the church? Is it time for you to buy a new car or build a new house? Is it time for you to repair the leaking roof of your church? If time has not come for evangelism. In our ways, oh God, I want to do it my own way. Your way. Those that follow their way like so, they end up with cost rather than blessing. Even doing it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> How must a disciple die? Jesus said this. By not loving his own life, you don't need to love your food, your accommodation. Many of us, when we were called into ministry, we were hindered by the devil for many years, not because the anointing was not there, but because the devil deceived us to love what we will eat more than God, to love our future more than God, to love our finances more than God. To love our marriage more than God. To love ourselves more than we love God. That means not promoting yourself. Don't, you don't need promotion. I have been in the mission field for more than 20 times. 95% of those trainings were done in secret. We don't even have video recorded of it. Some pictures we have are not the pictures that are present in the internet. 
like Koran did and was swallowed up alive in the grave. You don't need to advertise your authority. I want to show you today that I am a strong man of God. That I have matured. I can prophesy better than Moses. I can testify better than this. Did God speak only to you? Does he not also speak to me? I saw vision the same way you see vision. Are you the only leader of this group? Are you the one financing this group alone? The Lord is saying to you. You know what happened to Korah, Abiram, and the host of others? They died an uncommon death. The same thing can happen to you. If you stand in the way of God, you can die an uncommon death. Like Korah did, I was swallowed alive by the grave when God opened up the earth. In number 16 verse 32. That means no fighting to get your own ways. Not my way, your, but God's way. I remember when God called me into the ministry. What it preceded with the next day was a warning of something I must not do. And when I woke up from the trance, I was furious and angry, not with me, but with God. How can God give me such a task? And is angry with me for not doing things my way. And he showed me something that I never even thought of. And he's warning me not to do it. When God warns you of something you did not have in your mind, it is not to destroy you. It's a guidance. That means no fighting to get your own ways as Moses did. God, I pray the man whom you will send. God is sending you, you are saying you pray the man whom God will send. Who is God going to send? Not you. Did God not see Aaron? Did he not see all the children of Israel? Why did God allow you to be born as a proper child? Is it not because he has a plan for your life? Why did God not allow you to die as a premature child when you were young? Is it not because he has chosen you from the belly? And because he has formed you? And has ordained you to be a prophet to the nation? Why not use your time and your life to serve him today? And get the benefits? Moses taught him serve a better way. But that took 40 years in the wilderness instead of a shortcut. God told you to lead the people of Israel to the wilderness. You have to send people to go and spy the land. Did God send you to spy the land? No. Why not lead the people? When they get there, they will see the land and they go into it. He would have spent 40 days. He ended up spending 40 years because he sent to his spies. God did not tell you to send to his spies. That means no helping God to fulfill his promises. Oh God, if I work hard, I will raise money that I need for your work. <laughs> God can do his work. I know when I started this mission, the mission did not get very far because we're trying to help God. We labor day and night, put income together to help God. The more income we take to the mission, the more it's stolen. The more we gather together, the more the enemy blows upon it and everything disappears. But very soon, God taught us a better way. He made me understand that when I get to his feet, I should look up to the hills where my help comes from. So when God wants to send me into his ministry the next time, he said, do not take a bath. Do not take shoe. Do not take clothes. Do not even take two sandals. Go just the same way you are. And when I went to that mission, I stayed almost a year. The Lord feed me. The Lord took care of me. And brought me back. Since that time, I knew to depend on God, not to, to depend on man. Not to depend on my pockets, my ability, my wisdom, my knowledge, my skills for the service of the Lord. And by doing so, brought about the birth of Ishmael. Abraham wanted God to let him do his own will. God promised me, I will be the father of many nations, I don't have son of my own. Sarah says, instead of we have waited for this God, are you sure this God will ever come to pass? Just take this, my servant, go and sleep with her. And so that she can give birth 
and this bed can be the head. Is that what God told you? God told you Sarah will have a child. He didn't tell you Ishmael will be the head. He told you Sarah will give you a child. Wait patiently. That's why the Bible said, they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. Christians should learn to wait. Even when all parameters are against your waiting. When everything in life turns against your waiting period. Keep waiting. Wait and wait. I remember in Golan when I waited for the Lord. After fasting for many days. I have neither food nor water to drink. But the Lord told me to wait. The last day, the last cup of rice, I put it in the fire and said, God, today if I eat this one, I wait for death. Since you said I should wait. That day God sent a help. God never comes to it. He knows the right time to meet you. That's why the Bible tells you the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. Like Abraham and Sarah did. They waited, but the waiting was too long. Sarah has passed menopause. He decided to send his maid to Abraham. And doing so brought about the birth of Ishmael, the father of Islam. And a price of impatience that we are still paying for this very day. Today, Ishmael won Jerusalem at all costs. And this was not God's plan in Genesis 16. So learn to understand. Masia is in Arabia. So this is the home of Ishmael. But that is exactly what no waiting for God can lead to. No waiting for God may still take you to your destination. It can create an enemy you will fight throughout your lifetime. Jesus never meant that we are to hate the one precious life that God has given us. Rather, we are to hate our own life in this world. Not that does not mean you want to commit suicide. When he said hate your life, he's not talking about you killing yourself. He's talking about the desire of this life. The things that people enjoy and fashion in this world. Things that men cannot do without. You have to ignore it. That's why Christian fast. When we fast, we separate ourselves from the earthly nature. We put to death the desire of the flesh. We go before God, telling God that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Rather, we hate our life in this world. The life the world offer is a life of eating, a life of drinking, a life of merriment, a life of merry for to tomorrow we die. It doesn't matter. We eat today, tomorrow we die. And that is the end. That is what the word tells you. That is what the word says life is. Drink, try drug, sex, selfish living. No wonder Jesus died to it and says no. Hate it. This is not what life is about. Hate this type of life. A disciple must follow Jesus. To be with him means discovering where Jesus is. Then follow Jesus on rules. From Luke 14, 25 to 33, where we read that a disciple must love Jesus more than any other. Even more than his own father, mother, wife, family. If, for example, father tries to entice you to worship the family idol, you say, no, I love Jesus. If brother-in-law invites you to go gambling with him, you say, no, I love Jesus. Just as we read in chapter 14, verse 26, carrying your own cross, 
This is the path that Christians always want to run away from. Today we see Christians running from one church to the other. What are they looking for? A place where I will not have to carry load. Where everything is already built. Before I come to church in the morning, somebody has arranged the chair. All I need to do is to come on Sunday morning and sit down in the chair. That somebody else arranged. And on Sunday morning, I come, the floor is already sweet. So I don't need to use my hand to sweep anymore. Before I come, the chorus starts singing beautifully. I don't care to know how they practice. Before I come to church on Sunday, the Sunday school reader is already standing, well knitted and with tie and suits, and is ready to teach Sunday school excellently. I don't know want to know how he practice. My own is to sit down and take my notes and minister and write down the word of God. And at the end, I will make it to heaven. Praise the Lord. Is that not what Christians of today want? <laughs> Jesus just make it known to you that Christianity is not like that. Christianity is carrying your individual cross. If there are 2,000 people in the church, each of them must have one cross. If there are 500 members in the church, 500 cross. If there are two members in the church, two cross. So the lower the number, the lower the cross. So you must, every man, when the church needs finance, gather together and raise it. When the church is broke, all of you are broke. When the church needs instruments, all of you practice. When they need chorister, all of you practice. That's why in mission and open house fellowship, we believe in smaller units. Because in smaller units, you cannot shift the responsibility. And you cannot say, don't worry, only John will do it. Why me? I will keep my own. But when you will soon know that John Owen is not able to feed you with mineral every Sunday, so, you must make your own personal donation to help the team. Because you are not giving it to any man, you are giving it to your team. And your team needs you, you need your team. You need each other to survive. You all are God family. You need each other to survive. I need you, you need me. We need each other to survive. That is what makes Christianity. That is to be the weight and suffering or doing whatever it costs to obey the will of God as Jesus did. You have to go through personal pain, offer the things you do not have to make sure that the gospel of the kingdom is preached. Not just to you, but to all men as a testimony against them. Give up everything he has. You must be ready to give it up. If you still have something you value more than God in your life, you are neither worshiper. There must be a willingness to give up all for the sake of the kingdom. Which means to say, whatever you thought was yours actually belongs to God. And is his to use and yours brother to use as God directs. Your car is not your car, but belongs to the missions. Whenever they want to go for mission, make your car available. Oh, your house is not your heart. It belongs to the missionary team. When they want a place to stay, make your home available. Your food is not only for you and your children alone. When they are hungry, share the food in total. Make it available for the mission team. Your finance is not only for you to save in the bank. Make it available for the gospel of Christ. And a disciple must also always want to be where Jesus is. Jesus finished his work. He ascended to the Father and is seated at the right hand of the Father. You must also fight a good fight of faith and finish the task so that the crown of victory which the Father will give them who love his appearing will be waiting for you in heaven. You must always strive to enter in. Because the Bible tells you that many will try to enter into it. They will not be able. Not because the door is not open 
or the door is half shut? No, because they will not be able to subject themselves to soft discipline of hating their own flesh, putting their body under complete control, as to be able to assess the kingdom that is made for God's children. Not asking for deliverance from suffering, trial, or death, asking only for God's glory to be manifested. Not asking God to do your will, but that God should do his will in your life. As we discover in John 12, let's read John 12, verse 26 to 27. John 12, verse 26 to 27. John 12. Verse 26 to 27. He said, If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall my there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, he will my father honor. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. In verse 27, he said, Now is my soul troubled? And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I, what? I came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. In verse 28. Then shall there a voice, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. I have both glorified and I will glorify it again. Look at Jesus. He was tempted as we were, even beyond all temptation. He said, what will I say? My spirit is vexed even near unto death. But what shall I say? God save me from this hour? No. You have come to a point in the mission. They are about to stone you to death for your faith. What shall you say to God? God, how? Just allow me to deny you for today. Tomorrow I will repent again and become your servant. Is that what you are going to tell God? God is saying to you, what did Jesus say when he came to that situation? Did he say, God, let me deny you first. Today, this temptation is too heavy for me to bear. I will come back to you. He said, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He also come to that point. The devil tempted him to that measure. To be able to say, Father, save me from this hour. He said, no. But for this cause, know the reason why you get sent. A servant is not greater than his master. What purpose are you here? Jesus said, It is because of this suffering that I came into the world. Will I say God save me from it? No, I came because of this purpose. What about you? Do you know the purpose why you are in the field? Oh, you get to the field. Before you get there, let's not say, If you come down for the tree, I will sacrifice you to the gods. And you said, hey, God, it don't happen. Did you send me here to that? <laughs> what purpose will you send? And you said, God, I'm going back. I don't want to die. Did you remember why God sent you to that village? Did you remember why he sent you to that town? Your purpose was to save life, to deliver men from darkness. Have you completed the work? Now you are running away because of threats. Because somebody threatens your life? Who tells you if you are on the highway, you will not die? If you are in your home, in your bed, can you not lie down and wake up the next morning? Is that why you are running away? Stand. If you are willing to lose your life, you will gain it for the sake of Christ. But if you don't lose it willingly, you try to gain it, you will lose it. And that's why Jesus said, Father, Glorify your name. Always remember to tell God to glorify his name. In your mission field, let his name be glorified. In your ministry, even if you have one convert, you were hoping for 10,000, one convert came. Glorify God's name. Because he alone can draw near to himself. And glorify his name for that one that came. And God will hear his words like Jesus. Telling you, I will glorify it and I will glorify it again. He will glorify it while you are on earth, and when you get to heaven, He will glorify it again. And heaven said, Yes, that is right. Father, 
was so pleased with his son, with what his son was saying, that he leaned over the balcony of heaven and spoke. <laughs> so confirming Jesus' message. The unbeliever said it was thunder. <laughs> and the religious people said it was an angel that spoke. But Jesus said it was the voice of God. In John 12, verse 29 to 30, the voice of God came. The voice did not come because of Jesus. It came because of us. 29, verse 20 to 30. I read. He said, The people therefore said, that stood by, heard it, and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel spoke to him. And Jesus said, Jesus said, The voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 33. He said, Signify what death he should die. What death he should die. Hmm. Jesus then prophesied the first eminent judgment and the defeat of Satan, bringing the release of his grief on man. In 12, verse 21, then his own death. And the purpose it will accomplish on the cross. So opening the way to God so that as many as wish to see, Jesus may indeed be able to see and know Jesus before themselves. In chapter 12, verse 32 to 33 in the book of John. Now we understand what death will glorify God in Christ? What about us? Today, are we still living a life that God has planned or preordained for us? Is it the plan and the purpose we have? Today, you have just learned why discipleship is necessary. That the first call of every leader is to be a disciple. Brethren, today, I want to pray with you that God who has started with us should prepare you and make you accomplish your mission not just as a disciple but you should grow into leadership. A leader who does not go through discipleship will become a terror. It's only a terror who refuses discipleship. Every leader that is ordained by God want to submit himself to steep training so that he can be a full leader in the manifold grace of God. As a Christian, you must submit yourself to chastisement. The Bible says, if we be without chastisement, we are not sons, but we are bastards. If we be with chastisement, then are we some? We are in a society today where chastisement is underestimated as punishment. Chastisement is not punishment. The chastisement is necessary for correction. That's why the scriptures was given to believers. The scripture was given to us for correction, for instruction, so that the man of God can be equipped in every good work. So today, God expects us as a disciple to be equipped for every good work. God bless you as you apply this to your own life. Let us pray. Father, we have heard what it means to be a disciple and be transformed from discipleship into a leader. 
Lord, as we start our journey into the ministry that you have called us into, Lord, grant us the grace to die there and to live our life not to seek our own things, but to mind the things that come from God and to mind the things that come from others. O oh Lord, make us that vessel of honor as Jesus was to you. Let our life give God glory. Let our healing give God glory. Let our signs and wonders give God glory. Let our ministration give God glory. Let our mission give God glory. Let everything we do on earth give God glory. That the Father himself will be pleased with us as he was pleased with Jesus. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, as many that have come to this gathering, having any form of problem or situation, or that have labor and are tired of labor, I decree rest for their soul in the name of Jesus who died and rose again on the third day. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you participate in this teaching. Brethren, if you miss any of this teaching, join us at CGF Open Heart Fellowship on Facebook, or you can go to our website on cgfnslogin.app. Cgfnslogin.app. There you can view the video that is passed. God bless.